welcome everyone to today's program. I am Caitlin Arthur with Beckers Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenter will attempt to answer as many questions as she can during this time. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at this time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Kathleen is the Infection Prevention Strategic Resource Manager at the St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City. In her role, she offers a unique clinical perspective into the development of evidence-based policies, procedures, and practice, and practice designed to improve health outcomes. Prior to this, Kathleen served as an infection prevention and control coordinator, responsible for all aspects of the infection prevention program, including data analysis, education, and implementation of the infection prevention policies, procedures, and protocols. Kathleen is a member of the Kansas Healthcare Associated Infections Advisory Group. Kathleen has served as president of the Kansas City Area Chapter of the Association for, for Professionals in Infection Control and is currently the chair of the Education Committee. Kathleen received her BSN and MBA from Avila University and has been practicing infection prevention and control since 1996. She has been a certi certified infection prevention and control professional since 2002. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Kathleen to begin today's presentation. Good day. As uh, Caitlin said, my name is Kathleen Hallmeyer. I'm with the St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City. And we're going to talk about uh, surgical clipping. Uh, as, as Caitlin stated, I have been uh, practicing in infection prevention since 2002. And um, through the course of my practice, I've developed some, some um, good insights into uh, surgical site infection prevention. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the rationale for clipping and how, what, and when, where to clip, and does it really matter? Um, next we'll move into the cleanup issues, um, the, the risks and solutions, and uh, to, to conclude we'll look at a vacuum assisted technology to assist in surgical clipping. This presentation was made possible by, a, by support from BD. Now we're going to talk about a little bit about how we clip. Um, hair can interfere with the surgical field of vision and can be associated with a lack of cleanliness. The removal of hair is linked to good infection prophylaxis. Um, there have been occasional healthcare associated infection outbreaks uh, specifically surgical site infections that have been traced to organisms isolated from the hair or scalp. These organisms include Staph aureus and Group A Streptococcus. However, um, clipping is, is um, not without controversy. Uh, and appropriate hair removal is a key component of your overall uh, healthcare associated infection prevention strategy. I've put up a slide here, um, it, a fish bone diagram, um, to look at the many factors that can contribute to the development of a healthcare associated infection. And as you can see, there are many, many factors here um, that can contribute to this. And as I mentioned, um, good surgical hair removal and environmental uh, minimizing environmental contamination are very important to achieving that good outcome um, of uh, no healthcare associated infection. To clip or not to clip, that is the question. Um, I do know that um, in my practice we've been discussing um, do we clip or not clip since the 1980s. Um, both CDC and AORN recommend that the hair should not be removed um, unless that hair interferes with the incision site and, the, and or the surgical procedure. Um, most um, commonly 
procedures associated with hair removal would be orthopedic uh, lower extremities, your total knee replacement procedures, knee arthroscopies, uh, cardiovascular procedures, especially your um, uh, cabbage procedures and um, your um, procedures that require access through the femoral vessel. OBGYN procedures such as your total abdominal hysterectomies um, and your cesarean sections. And of course, um, neurosurgical procedures involving the head, uh, really, you have to look at, at hair removal there and how it can impact the incision and the, the surgical procedure. Uh, some of your um, uh, upper extremity procedures necessitate uh, hair, hair removal. And abdominal and gastrointestinal procedures such as uh, colon resections and um, uh, abdo abdominal procedures, large abdominal procedures. Microabrasions caused by razors create a portal for infection. Um, there are multiple studies out there that show that shaving damages the skin and increases the infection risk. The pathogens most commonly associated with healthcare-associated infections are, are skin-dwelling um, organisms, um, specifically uh, staph, the staph species and streptococcal species. Over the years, we've learned that razor shaving increases the infection risk by creating these microabrasions that allow the skin uh, organisms to collect and multiply and work their way into the, uh, into the surgical site um, area. You can see on these slides, um, particularly in the, uh, the uh, lower uh, right-hand corner, the microabrasions that have been created by the um, uh, razor. And again, these microabrasions uh, allow the opportunity for um, organisms to enter. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are multiple studies showing lower uh, HAI rates with clipping as opposed to shaving. Um, I think the, the one that got my attention was uh, Alexander's study in 1983 um, showing um, that the razor clipping was 6.4% percent more likely to increase uh, your HAI um, infections. And what we've learned is pro when used properly, electric clippers are less likely to damage the skin and are overall associated with lower infection rates. Um, most of you may be familiar with the Surgical Care Improvement Project, or SCIP, and clipping versus uh, shaving is one of our performance measures for that. Um, and uh, for a time, this measure has been retired now, but for a time, hospital reimbursement was uh, tied to uh, whether or not they were clipping versus uh, using a razor to shave. Um, cl when clipping is necessary, um, many of the uh, guy uh, professional societies recommend clippers instead of razors. These agencies include AORM, CDC, uh, HICPAC, uh, IHI, and I mentioned the SKIP project. Um, and there are some international guidelines, the Association for Perioperative Practice. Um, all are recommending uh, clipping rather than shaving. Now, the big question is when to clip? Does timing matter? Um, clipping hair immediately before an operation is associated with a lower risk of infection than clipping the night before. Both AORN and CDC do recommend that if the hair must be removed, it should be removed immediately before the operation and preferably with electric clippers. In my own organization, um, I have several surgeons uh, who are recently out of training and their understanding of, this, of these guidelines is that uh, clipping or hair removal should be done as close to the time of incision as possible uh, to minimize 
the risk of, of healthcare associated infection. Um, again, several studies show significant uh, reduction in HAI uh, rates when clipping immediately before sur uh, surgery. In one study, uh, 476 patients undergoing uh, cl a clean surgery compared clipping on the day of surgery with clipping one day preoperatively. And what we found is about 8% of patients clipped one day preoperatively developed a uh, healthcare associated infection um, as compared with uh, others who were clipped the morning uh, or the right before the procedure. So best practice is to clip as close to the incision time as possible, which this brings us to our next dilemma. Where do we clip, inside of the OR or in the pre-op holding? CDC and AORN both recommend that hair removal uh, be performed out side of the operating room because clipping is associated with the dispersion of hair fibers uh, and skin flora. There's also a cleanup and possible contamination of the operative field with the, um, the uh, hair fibers. Observational data and surveys show that in the actual OR practice, um, much, m m most of the clipping is done inside the OR. I did mention that I have some surgeons in my health system that uh, request to do the clipping inside of the OR. And again, their rationale is that um, clipping should be done as close to the incision time as possible. Um, other reasons for clipping inside the OR include patient privacy. Your pre-op holding areas are generally not the calmest and most private places. Um, many places have the open bays with uh, multiple curtains uh, and multiple patients undergoing, uh, undergoing preparation all at the same time. Um, also, Clipping inside the OR reduces the potential for delay. You've got that patient in the OR and you're ready to go. You're not waiting on them to be clipped in the preoperative area. There are emergency situations where um, you're moving patients from ICU or emergency departments uh, and uh, uh, moving them directly to the OR where clipping needs to be performed inside of the OR. Uh, in my own practice, I have seen um, nursing staff and surgical technicians and even physicians uh, who have a preference to clip when the patient is sedated and under, under anesthesia. Another um, issue is training. I, I mentioned again my surgeons who are relatively new out of training um, are request to, to clip inside of the OR. Uh, I've also spoken with surgical techs who tell me that their um, training was that, that they clip inside of the OR and again the rationale is to um, uh, clip immediately as close to the time of incision as possible. Um, what we found in our studies is um, that around 60% of the um, um, nurses and, and technicians surveyed um, are clipping inside of the OR with 40% clipping outside of the uh, OR in the pre-op area. To summarize the recommendation for um, periop hair removal, uh, again, don't remove it unless you need to remove it. If the presence of the hair will interfere with the surgical procedure and removal is in the best interest of the patient, um, go ahead and remove that. However, you really need to take the following precautions. Um, hair removal should be performed the day of surgery and ideally in a location outside of the operating room. This is from the AORN um, standards and only as much hair that, that interferes with the surgical procedure should be removed. Um, hair should be clipped using a single-use uh, electric or battery-operated clipper. 
uh, with a disposable head that can be, uh, or a reusable head uh, that can be um, disinfected between patients. And these um, uh, reusable heads must be disinfected according to the manufacturer's um, recommendations so that you're ensuring that these are adequately disinfected between patients. Um, just as a um, clinician, my preference is that we use a, a disposable uh, clipper head to eliminate the need to disinfect those um, uh, reusable heads between patients. Um, anytime you have to clean or um, reprocess an item that takes time out of your day, it also is a uh, human process. And as you know, humans can make mistakes. And I just find it's, it's best to eliminate the work of the human uh, in there um, in an effort to eliminate the risk of breakdown in processes. And so our preference in, in my system is a disposable um, clipper head. Again, clipping is associated with a lower uh, HAI rate than shaving and is more cost effective uh, over the long run. Um, some of the things that I have done in my own practice to uh, ensure compliance with uh, clipping versus razors is um, uh, we have restricted access to razors. Um, if you try to order a razor in our system, a note is sent um, to the ordering person and to a, a designated person. This might be a surgery um, coordinator or manager. and um, there's a message that says uh, so-and-so has requested to order a box of razors uh, for the surgery department and um, please review this and approve this request. Um, that way the surgery manager uh, or designee can consult with the orderer or the person ordering these razors to find out what is the indication for those razors. Uh, and uh, then work to educate on the best practice of clipping as opposed to uh, uh, using a, a razor. Um, I also have become more involved in educating patients and making sure that our um, patient information is updated to, to um, discourage patients from shaving prior to surgery. Um, and I, I find this is a particular concern with my total joint patients. Um, my um, um, female total joint patients will often um, want to shave prior to their surgical procedure. And when you explain to them that um, shaving creates micro abrasions into the skin um, that offer an opportunity for uh, infection, um, I've not encountered one uh, patient who has said, uh, I'm still going to shave anyway. They, they will um, follow the preoperative instructions from the surgeon in our preoperative department. Um, there are some issues with surgical clipping, and I have seen this um, in my own practice. It's very, very, very important that the manufacturer's instructions for use of the clippers are um, followed. It's also very important that there be good training on using these clippers. Um, I have seen situations where um, there, there is um, raking, as you can see in these two pictures. And the raking was caused um, by a pressing down with the clippers, or multiple passes with the clippers, or holding the clippers at an improper angle. Um, direction and angle are very important um, fundamentals to proper, properly using a surgical clipper. Um, and, and this is a learning curve that I observed when we went from one uh, clip, clipper uh, product to another the angle of the uh, clipper head was different. And the techs and the nurses who were um, using these clippers were not aware or did not recognize that angle was different. And we saw some raking um, when we 
implemented these new clippers early on. And one of the things we noted was um, they said, uh, you know, a clipper is a clipper and we don't need any training or in-servicing. And in-servicing and, and practicing um, with those clippers is, is crucial to ensuring that, that you're not damaging the skin. And as you can see on the right, the um, raking can severely damage the skin and create a, a portal of infection. Uh, and in, in many cases, in, if we saw this happen in a total joint patient or, or abdominal um, case, uh, we would delay or cancel the surgery until the skin was healed. Um, very hairy body parts are also um, prone to um, having the healthcare worker make multiple passes. Um, they want to get that um, skin as clear, um, soft as a baby's bottom, so to speak. And it's really not necessary to do that. You need to remove as much hair as you need to so the incision um, site can be visible and accessible. You don't need a completely clean, smooth um, surface, uh, skin surface to work with. Uh, and, and training on avoiding repeat passes is crucial to avoid the uh, risk of skin damage. Um, the more times you pass that clipper over the skin, um, there is a risk of increased um, skin damage. Now we have the problem of what to do with all that hair that we've clipped off. What do we do with the waste? Um, surgical hair clippings do contain uh, pathogenic bacteria and as well as normal skin flora. Um, if you remember from uh, maybe your physiology lessons, um, hair is a protective mechanism. Um, it um, can serve as a filter, uh, particularly our eyelashes and eyebrows and the, the hair on our heads prevents um, bacteria. It captures bacteria and skin flora and keeps that from getting into our eyes or um, creating, um, you know, infections on our um, scalp. So it, it's, uh, I had had a um, clinical instructor one time tell me that hair is a, is a um, germ magnet. And in, in some respects, it is a magnet um, and does contain the same um, pathogens um, that cause it healthcare associated infections. Um, you've also clipped all this hair and you have um, skin, skin particles and you've, you've air, made it airborne um, clipping. And so you've got all, the, you've got all this uh, clipping residue on the patient and on the linens and on the floor and um, you know, everywhere that can contaminate the environment. Um, with the advent of the um, patient satisfaction or HCAP scores, um, patients and their families are observing our environment uh, more and more. And if they see hair on the floor in a, um, in a room, in a, even in a um, preoperative uh, holding area, um, they're going to wonder how clean is the rest of our facility. Um, so it's, it's more than a cosmetic issue. Um, it, it is a, an infection risk, and it's a patient satisfaction risk, uh, and an environmental contamination risk. Um, what we found, too, in using these clippers is we can see some airborne dispersion of these clippings that can, can uh, disperse more than a foot away from the patient, which can contaminate your, um, your field and your, um, your, your sterile um, areas. So let's talk about uh, clipped hair cleanup. Adhesive tapes and sticky mitts may actually contribute to the problem. Um, rolls of tape just make me crazy in it, as an infection preventionist. Um, 
you get contaminated hair everywhere in your environment. Um, you can get this on, on linens, wheels, floors uh, that can be migrated, tracked into the OR and elsewhere throughout your facility. The adhesive tapes that everybody uses for hair cleanup are, are not sterilized. Um, tape is not a sterile product. And in general, your tape is not kept under controlled conditions, and the same rolls of tape are usually dropped into the caregiver's pocket, and they go from patient to patient. And what you can see is contamination of that roll of tape um, with hair from previous patients. Um, my favorite is the um, roll of tape that's been contaminated with the uh, pocket lint out of the, uh, in the pocket of the scrub jacket. Uh, what's interesting to note is 70% of the nurses surveyed uh, said that they sometimes or always notice um, contamination or stuff stuck to the tape roll that um, might be stored in the drawer um, in your pre-op holding or even in your operating rooms. Uh, and these issues um, really increase the risk of cross-contamination. I, I think that we may have underestimated the um, contamination and what's growing on our um, tape. Uh, Rettelmeyer um, did do some studies on this and found that um, adhesive tape rolls can become colonized with organisms and contribute to HAIs. Um, they looked at 40 uh, used tape rolls uh, that were collected throughout the hospital and um, took some samples in e from each of those rolls and incubated it for one day. Um, these uh, specimens were compared um, with unused controls and what they found was 74% of those tape specimens were colonized with some sort of a pathogenic bacteria and some of those specimens were exhibiting polymicrobial growth. Um, there were, um, in some instances, there were uh, growth that showed colonies too numerous to count in almost half of the specimens studied. Uh, and they, they found um, uh, pathogens such as E. coli, Pseudomonas, um, all sorts of, of highly pathogenic bacteria. Uh, Berkowitz, um, this, this study uh, really caught my attention and um, has led me to drive some changes in practice around our organization. Um, in a 16-bed ICU in a teaching hospital, um, they looked at uh, 24 new rolls of adhesive tape, tested those to ensure that they were free of microorganisms, then put those in the ICU uh, for use. And at intervals of one, five, and seven days after initial culturing, each roll was recultured and its location in the unit was recorded. Um, they looked for where they found those tape, those rolls of tape. A hundred percent of those um, tape rolls that were used were contaminated with uh, Pseudomonas, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, uh, and coagulase positive staph. Uh, five of the, the 23 tape rolls um, actually migrated to different locations in the unit. Um, this again was where the tape was dropped into the caregiver's pocket and um, it, it went to another patient room and was removed and taken out um, to be used on another patient. Um, in this day of multi-drug resistant organisms, um, this is really risky um, practice to carry these rolls of tape around from patient to patient. And I do think that um, this is my own thoughts on this. I do believe that um, we're going to see more attention paid to the role of tape in, in um, transmission and the potential for adhesive tape to um, grow or support um, bacteria. Uh, and we do know um, Harris um, did, did look at uh, surgical adhesive tape and um, does it have the potential to act as a fomite in healthcare settings and uh, 
Um, this study showed that the side surfaces of the tape roll, that is the outer edges, uh, um, were contaminated with um, greater numbers of bacteria than the tape, than the actual surface of the tape. Um, again, this um, this is where I see the the um, the pocket lint uh, and the the hair um, clippings that have accumulated on the tape. Um, and, and it just looks dirty <laughs> um, when you look at that, that roll of tape. The, the um, actual surface of the tape looks good. It's the side surfaces. And what the researchers theorized with these side surfaces do provide a larger surface area for bacterial growth. And of course, you know, the more uh, real estate you have to grow bacteria, um, the um, more likely you are to, to have a nice bacterial growth. Um, so one of the, the um, standard practices in infection prevention is to ask about um, surface area. The less surface area you have, the less um, risk of bacterial growth you're going to have. Um, tape rolls are often placed on their side. Um, they're, they're much easier to store like that. Um, and, and again, they are dropped into caregivers' pockets. And when you um, store that on its side, um, the, the size of that tape is likely to be exposed to uh, environmental surface contamination. Um, I um, was, was rounding the other day and saw a um, roll of tape, a large roll of tape placed on a um, bedside table where there was a, uh, a urinal <laughs> that had been used right there. And I watched the nursing assistant take the urinal away and dump that. And then shortly thereafter, the nurse came in and used the tape to uh, reinforce a dressing. Uh, I, I was able to put a stop to that before that actually got used. But um, there is a lot of concern in my mind about um, the environmental contamination of tape and the side surfaces. Um, as you know, if you touch a, a, a roll of tape, the side surfaces are coated with the sticky residue um, of the adhesive, which again um, acts as sort of a magnet. The bacteria um, can, and particulates, particularly the hair um, and skin, skin cells, uh, can adhere to the side surfaces of that tape. Um, as you can see uh, from this diagram, uh, the side surfaces um, of the tape do have much greater surface area. Uh, and, and can um, um, support um, bacterial uh, contamination. Um, the researchers concluded that removing a portion of the um, tape really doesn't make any difference in reducing microorganisms um, because the majority of the organisms are found on the side surfaces of the tape. Um, I've seen caregivers uh, who pull out the roll of tape from their pocket and they pull off um, a little strip and throw that away before they uh, proceed to use the tape. And what Harris, Harris's research shows us is that that really doesn't, um, doesn't make any impact on the contamination risk because the contamination is on the side surfaces of that um, roll of tape. Um, in my own organization, I've looked at um, single single uh, use adhesive tape rolls, and um, is it practical to do that? Um, single use uh, rolls of tape are, are very expensive, um, and it, it, it's most of the time not cost effective to do that. And uh, an article in Infection Control today looked at um, some research in, in two different hospitals that looked at uh, adhesive tape uh, from 20 patient rooms and 65 patient discharges. Um, the average tape use was only about a yard out of a 10-yard roll um, and, and uh, two yards in each hospital uh, respectively. And if you project this usage um, for the hospital's annual activity, you would see um, about 126 miles of tape um, deposited into landfills. Uh, that's a lot of tape. Um, so, um, 
So uh, what what we concluded uh, in our own organization is that disposing of, of tape rolls after each use really just isn't practical. And um, as I practiced, uh, nurses are um, good stewards of resources, and they are very reluctant to throw away a roll of tape that's only been used once or had a, a, a yard or two taken off of it. Um, they, uh, by by nature, uh, want to, to take, save that roll of tape, and so it get dro gets dropped into their pocket, and it goes off to the next patient room where it um, gets contaminated again and again and again. Uh, tape and sticky mints can also damage skin, and I think this is um, un unrecognized. I'm not sure that um, providers recognize. Uh, the, the um, risk of skin damage with sticky mitts. Um, more and more clinicians are aware of, of uh, skin stripping with tape, but not always uh, uh, aware of the risks with sticky mitts. Uh, what you have happen is you get skin stripping and microabrasions um, used uh, or that occur with tape and sticky mitts. As we know, uh, tape can damage soft, friable, delicate skin and, and can cause adverse skin reactions. Um, especially in our uh, senior citizen population, our uh, elderly folks have very uh, friable skin and aggressive use of tape and sticky mitts can um, cause skin tears and uh, micro abrasions that, of course, damage the skin and can serve as a portal of, of infection. Uh, also, we see a, a fair number of patients who have uh, reactions to tape um, and, and the adhesive in that tape. And I, I have seen situations where uh, the, the um, reaction to the tape has been significant enough where the case has been delayed until um, there is some skin healing. Also, when you're using tape, and uh, um, there is a potential for your gloves to tear or rip when you're using that uh, adhesive tape, especially when you uh, wrap that tape uh, around your um, glove hand and use it as sort of a, a, a mini mitt, uh, so to speak, or, or a, a mitt. Um, and, and you know, gloves getting torn um, can create a risk of, of um, transmission to the healthcare worker if that healthcare worker has um, non-intact skin underneath that glove. Um, also, um, again, it just doesn't um, doesn't always remove the the, um, the hair very well, and when you've got um, you know, tape wrapped around your fingers uh, to, to try to remove that hair. Um, not only is the, um, the risk of the gloves tearing, but there can be, as I mentioned earlier, you can see some ripping of the skin with that too. Um, next, um, I do want to talk about um, the time required for, for um, surgical clipping and cleanup. This really impacts your efficiency. Um, time associated with clipping uh, cleanup using tape and sticky mitts has never been well documented. Uh, a recent survey of 241 personnel reported that the average amount of time devoted to clipping and cleanup is about 4.1 minutes per case. That's an average. To get an average, you have to have a, a low number and a high number. Um, if, if you spend um, five minutes times 10 cases a day cleaning up uh, surgical clippings, uh, that's 50 minutes that you can add to your schedule. Uh, and as we know in the, in the um, operating room setting, uh, time is money. And in, in many of your, your ambulatory surgery centers or hospitals even, um, the ability to add 50 minutes uh, to the day can um, make a difference between uh, profitable and not profitable um, for, for you. Also, is cleaning up with tape very effective? There's very little data to um, 
quantify how much clip care is actually picked up when you use the, the tape method, so to speak. Um, and in the same survey, surgical professionals estimated that only about 71% of the, the hair was um, collected using tape. So um, you've, you've used this tape and you've um, tried to pick up as much hair as possible. You've still got about 29% of the hair um, that's not been collected. That hair, again, is um, can carry microorganisms that can contribute to the um, uh, development of, of um, healthcare associated infection. And again, uh, I mentioned the, the loose hair clippings on the floor, on the cart, on the linens can um, um, contribute to patient satisfaction. It's, it's viewed as dirty. Uh, so let's, let's um, talk about options to clipping. There is um, some newer vacuum-assisted technology that eliminates the need for surgical clipping. And it's, I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, pilot analysis of vacuum-assisted uh, clipping technology to reduce airborne contamination um, looked at uh, quantifying um, the, the reduction in hair disp dispersal using vacuum-assisted clippers. Um, also looking at my, microbial contamination in the hair left behind by a standard clipper. Um, their methods looked at hair dispersal and microbial contamination adjacent to your prep site, um, looking at using settle, settle plates. And residual hair was um, recovered using adhesive tape or sticky gloves, and the micro, microbial burden was assessed. What they found uh, was there was a significant reduction in microbial recovery and hair particle dispersion um, following the use of a vacuum-assisted clipper device, um, the clip vac. 98.5% uh, of uh, hair capture was achieved with the vacuum-assisted clipper. Um, the um, background and objectives um, of the study, uh, AORN was rec recommending that body hair should be removed when it may interfere with surgery and that hair removal should limit particle dispersion. Um, Preoperative body hair removal using uh, clippers requires less cleanup and um, less uh, opportunity to contaminate the operative field. Um, the study compared clipping duration and the amount of loose hair and microbial contamination following clipping with standard surgical clippers and, um, and removal of that dispersed hair via tape or uh, mitts, and then clippers fitted with a vacuum-assisted collection device. Um, methods trained RNs were um, clip the chest and groin of 18 male subjects. Um, uh, using a standard surgical clipper, and uh, the other side was uh, uh, clipped with a surgical clipper fitted with a vacuum-assisted hair collection device. The total clipping and cleanup times for the standard surgical clipper and the um, surgical clipper with a vacuum-assisted device were measured. Particulate matter and microbial contamination was measured prior to and during the clipping using settling plates. Um, also, transepidermal water loss was measured on the chest prior to and following clipping. What the results showed was there was a significant reduction in total clipping cleanup time with the use of a vacuum-assisted device. Um, and again, when you reduce the uh, cleanup time, that gives you the opportunity to uh, turn over your rooms more rapidly, maybe even add a few another case or two to your day. There was also significant reduction in the transepidermal water loss with the use of a uh, vacuum-assisted device. And I think this is um, interesting because, as, as we know, the, the healthy, intact, uh, moisturized skin is one of our best protections uh, against infection of, of any kind, not just surgical site infections. And one of the um, things that we look at when we evaluate um, um, skin products and surgical skin preps is um, does it uh, cause a transepidermal water loss? 
And anything we do to maximize um, the um, uh, risk of transepidermal water loss can help us maintain skin health. And in this study, we saw a significant reduction in this um, transepidermal water loss with the use of a vacuum device. Um, also, uh, it, with the settled plate uh, results, we saw a significant reduction in microbial contamination with a vacuum-assisted device in the uh, chest uh, and the, in the groin procedures. Um, we also found that um, tape harbors a significant of microbial bio burden. Um, the human skin has approximately 3.0 to 7 uh, log, ten, log to the 10th power colony forming units. And depending on the locations, um, our hands uh, have about 5 um, to the 10th power um, uh, colony forming units. Arm tips and groin, um, about seven to the tenth power, um, uh, colony forming units, and most other exterior skin is about three um, uh, to the tenth power log um, um, colony forming units. What we learned. Uh, in this uh, brief study was the use of the vacuum assisted clippers uh, re resulted in a significant reduction in the amount of time required to clip and clean up the dispersed hair as compared to our standard surgical clippers. The use of the um, vacuum assisted device eliminated a need to physically remove this dispersed hair from the operative field, um, which could harbor um, a significant bacterial uh, bio burden. The um, slightly observed increase in the transepidermal water loss um, with the uh, surgical clippers suggests that there is a potential uh, for damage to the um, barrier function of the skin. And as I mentioned, we want to keep that skin as intact and as healthy as we can. Uh, and minimizing the water loss is, is um, one way to do that. An independent rating of surgical clippers and the surgical clipper with a vacuum assisted device by nurse, nurses and study subjects in, uh, suggests that there is a major uh, perceived benefit um, uh, that included an increased speed of clipping and an increase in cleanliness and a more uh, comfortable experience for our patients. The clip back uh, solution. Um, provides a more effective and efficient surgical hair cleanup. Uh, it's a small, portable, battery-operated unit with a single-use tip and a filtered reservoir. Uh, it is specifically designed to fit the uh, CareFusion surgical clipper and, and create a complete clipping solution. It's a one-step process that would eliminate the need for cleanup with adhesive tape or sticky mitts, um, saving time and allowing you the opportunity to um, um, maximize your um, OR time and your, your um, uh, opportunity for um, scheduling. The unit is rugged um, uh, plastic housing with carry strap. It's very easy to wipe clean, can be cleaned. Um, using our standard uh, hospital grade disinfectant. It's lightweight, it's portable, it has a, a long life motor with um, a lithium ion battery that lasts about 75 minutes, even when run continuously. Um, it takes about four hours to re recharge. Uh, and uh, in, in, I've never heard of a clipping procedure <laughs> necessitating the uh, device to run for 75 minutes. Um, it's quite possible that you could uh, use the device for the uh, entire day um, without charging um, in some, some facilities. The surgical grade filter uh, captures an average of 98.5% of the clipped hair and debris, um, and it does capture uh, particles down to 0 0.3 microns. It is single patient use. It's non-sterile, latex-free, and can be recycled. Um, um, for maximum uh, um, environmental stewardship. 
In summary, uh, hair removal from clipping is, um, is a potential contamination risk. It's more than just a mess. And airborne uh, hair and airborne particles left behind on the patient and linens and floors can contaminate the peri-op environment. Adhesive tapes used in the cleanup processes are not kept under controlled conditions, and the same rules are frequently used on multiple patients, and they often contain hair and um, lint and, and whatever uh, dirt um, from previous cases. As we saw, 74% of tape specimens collected in one hospital were colonized with pathogenic bacteria. Anything we can do to reduce um, uh, colonies, bacterial colonies anywhere in our environment will um, assist in our overall strategy to reduce healthcare associated infections. 70% of nurses stated that they sometimes are always noticed that the tape is um, dirty or, or contaminated um, when they uh, go to pick up that roll of tape. Um, that to me is um, a little bit unnerving. Uh, makes me uh, concerned that um, they're, they're carrying bacteria from place to place. In summary, the clip back collects hair all in one step. The surgical grade filter captures an average of 98.5% uh, of the um, clipped hair and debris and filters down to a uh, 0.3 micron uh, particle size. Um, participants in the research uh, cited previously reported an average of only 71% of the hair is collected using adhesive tape, which leaves you about 29% there to contaminate your field and, and your um, operative site potentially. The clipback filter um, contains all that vacuum, vacuumed material and it's disposed with each use eliminating risks of cross-contamination that are possible with adhesive tape rolls. It's a one-step process, it's efficient, um, and it saves time. I would um, like just to let you know that, uh, again, the, the use of the clip back in my facilities has offered us the option to permit our surgeons to prep as close to the uh, cut time as possible. Um, for us, this has eliminated some concerns about do we follow the AORN standards or do we do what Dr. X is wanting to do. Um, this has, has um, the opinion of the staff has been very positive. They feel like it has um, impacted their ability to move patients in pre-op um, to the OR suite. And in, in some cases, um, the surgeons um, like to do their own clipping, and this allows them to do that easily. Um, and again, it is reducing some conflict um, between our surgeons and our, and our um, uh, staff. Um, the staff is, is adhering to AORN guidelines, and the surgeons are adhering to um, practices that they've learned in their own uh, uh, training. And while AORN is very clear and state that clipping should be done outside of the OR, um, as I mentioned, our surgeons who are coming out of training are saying um, that they learned and they understand that clipping should be done imme immediately prior to um, prep and cut. And so this has allowed us to kind of meet in the middle. Um, references, and I would highly encourage you to um, feel free to pull those references and take a look at them. The um, surgical clipper model um, has uh, nice ergonomics. Uh, there is a battery indicator on there, and it has a stronger exterior, uh, which holds up to the wear and tear uh, common in, in an operating room environment or preoperative uh, pre area. There is some simple push button technology. It's um, easier uh, blade application and there is a two-piece charging station for easy uh, cleaning of the uh, device. And are there questions?
Thank you, um, Kathleen, for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. Um, we'll now begin the Q&A portion of the program. So as a reminder, you can submit any questions that you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled, enter a question for staff, and then clicking send. Uh, our presenter will attempt to answer as many questions as she can during the time that we have for question and answer. So Kathleen, the first question that we have here, and I know that you briefly touched on this, um, AORN recommends clipping outside of the OR. Some surgeons want to clip inside the OR uh, and as close to surgery as possible. How do you address this issue? Well, as I, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's been a, a balancing act. Um, I mentioned uh, many of our surgeons who have come out of training uh, recently, and, and by recently I mean within the last um, three to five years, um, prefer to clip immediately prior to uh, the skin preparation and uh, cut, uh, cut uh, incision time in, in the operating room. Um, this allows us to kind of meet in the middle. It allows us to um, comply with um, the, the surgeon's request for uh, preoperative uh, hair removal as close to incision time as possible. The CDC guidelines also state uh, that if hair needs to be removed, it should be removed as close to the incision time as possible. And this does allow us to, as I said, meet in the middle um, so that we're, we are removing the hair as close to the time as possible, but we're minimizing the risks of contamination with the hair, uh, with the uh, clippings and, and debris. Fantastic. And then can you provide some recommendations on getting this into uh, different facilities? Um, I found it, it's best to work with your uh, operating room coordinators or uh, surgical services coordinators. Um, they can usually assist in driving the, this. It, it also needs to be a multidisciplinary approach. Um, I found that support from your infection preventionist is, is crucial. And also, um, surgeon support is critical to, get, to getting this in. Um, one of the concerns that I hear is um, cost. And I think you have to look beyond the device cost. Uh, you, you have to look beyond the hard dollar costs. You've got to look at the time it takes to clean up um, and the risks associated with a failure or an inadequate cleanup. Um, you've got to look at the turnover time, the faster we can turn our uh, operating rooms over, um, the opportunity we have to add more cases to our day. Uh, and, and I think you've got to look at all of that with your surgical services managers um, and your um, um, surgeons, your surgical technicians, your preoperative nurses, and, and take those um, factors into account when you uh, look at bringing this in. Um, and don't just look at the dollar cost. You've got to look at all the associated costs with, um, as I mentioned, increased uh, turnover time. Um, we haven't even factored in the risks of um, healthcare associated infection acquisition because we uh, damaged the skin with um, um, tape or, uh, God forbid, razors. <laughs> um, so rally your um, surgical coordinators, rally your team to, to get this brought in. Great, great. And then it looks like we have time for just one more question in the question and answer session. What are some critical success factors for ensuring that clipback is utilized once it has been brought into a facility? I do believe the um, crucial uh, factor is training 
and understanding how to use that uh, device. As I mentioned in our slides, um, there is a risk if the clipper is not held at a proper angle, at the angle that it is designed to be used at. Uh, you can risk raking and breaking that skin. Uh, and again, there are um, nurses, surgical technicians out there that think it's a clipper, I don't need to know how to use it. They need to practice, they need to understand um, the angle that that clipper needs to be held at to ensure proper uh, hair removal. Uh, I have seen some failed uh, implementation because the training and um, experience, uh, the hands-on training uh, was inadequate. Uh, and, and so they were using the clipper as they were using their prior uh, clipper product. And we saw some, some pretty serious uh, skin breakdown. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough how important adequate training is to the successful implementation of this uh, uh, device. Also, as I mentioned previously, you need to look at the cost benefit. Um, by implementing this, it's worthwhile to track the time that you're saving because in, in today's healthcare environment, time is money. And if we can save four minutes here, four minutes there, at the end of the day, we can have 40, 50 minutes or more um, that we can use to have more cases or um, engage in activities that ultimately improve patient outcomes if that's how we choose to um, to use the, the time that we've received back. Fantastic. Well, I just want to thank our presenter again for her excellent presentation and for all of you for participating in our webinar today. We look forward to having you join us for future presentations. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you.